I'm not here just because I get salary. I'm not here because I get name or fame. I'm here because God has sent me to be his instrument in touching the lives and hearts of people. We have, we have about 3,200 students and about 140 faculty members, another 100 non-teaching staff. And I see them every day with cheerful faces. And when a student after a few years you know, comes back to you and says, thank you yeah, for yeah. what you have been. Yeah. And that's the greatest thing that can happen in your life. And I've had so many. And so every good person goes through difficult life to become stronger. But every weak person goes through luxuries to become weaker. Wow. And so finally, yeah. you see, Bengal is an exemplary state to the whole country. In terms of the hard work, in terms of academic achievement, you take uh, the field of economics. I think almost all the economists are found here. <laughs> yes. All the Nobel laureates are out here, nowhere else. What some people don't know is, some people think he, is, he was principal, he is now vice chancellor, he must be having big bank accounts, he may be having credit cards and all that. I don't have a credit card. What are you saying, Father? Hello, Father. Good evening. Good evening, Father. Yes. It is uh, my privilege and an absolute honor for me to have you in our show. Uh, for me, the definition of Jesuit education in India is equal to Reverend Father Dr. J. Felix Raj. Oh no, that's too much. Uh, th that is what I feel, <laughs> Father. It's my personal opinion, <laughs> Father. And I'm so grateful that I get the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, how do you feel, Father? How are you? I feel good. And especially you've been associated with this university for quite some time. Yes, Father. And you've been our student. Yes, Father. So I feel good that your viewers will be watching this. And I'm sure it would be in some way or other benefiting them, I'm helping sure. them. I'm yes. sure, Father. So, Father, our university, I'm calling it our university with sure. your permission, sure. Father. Sure. Father, our university would be completing six years in July. We are in July, we'll be yeah. completing six years. Yeah. So, if I have to give you a time machine to go back mm. and remember your fondest memory of this yeah. university, I know it's very difficult to choose one, <laughs> but if I have to put you on the spot <laughs> and choose one fondest memory. There are many, okay? I know, as Father. you say, yes. there are many, but I can definitely tell you uh, one of the fondest memories. But uh, we are completing six years, but the concept of starting a university goes back to 2012. Yes, Father. Because I remember that it's a very interesting event that happened. Uh, we were celebrating the St. Xavier's College's convocation. Right, Father. And we were sitting together, both the Honorable Chief Minister and myself. And so at one point she said, uh, why don't you start a university? And I spontaneously said, if you give me land, I'll start the university. Right, and she said immediately, I give you the land, you start the university. That's how it began. And how immediate you know? was it, Father? It was just a week. Wow, Father. Just a week. I'm sure the whole is... thing, you know, the ball rolled and yeah. then when she said yes, it happened. And today we are and, yes, yes. and that was 2012. Right, Father. Now, 2013, in December, we had the foundation stone laying ceremony. Yeah, I remember, Father. Yeah. And the Honorable Chief Minister was there because I thought she was the right person to be there mm -hmm. and then to lay the foundation. That was a very interesting, I think, ceremony that we had. What, in fact, uh, impressed me was the involvement of the alumni right, and the students right. of the college. They came in hundreds. And I remember immediately after the program, the General Secretary of the Students' uh, Union at yeah. St. Xavier's College, and then the members of the union, they came to me and said, Father, we are going to celebrate it on the ground. Please oh, come. Wow. So they asked me to send to the Sky Lantern first. Right, Father. And there were hundreds of them. Yeah. After which, of course, the police came and asked me, Father, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but then the students enjoyed, you know. Yeah. They really participated. 
I remember the alumni and those students, you know, who came in for the foundation laying ceremony. And they were fully, with their hearts and minds together, mm -hmm. they were fully involved in it. And they also, I was told the chief minister will be there only for about half an hour. Right, Father. And she was there for more than two hours. Wow, Father. Because she got involved, you yeah. know. And she saw the crowd, she saw the alumni, and she got involved in it. Right, Father. And it was a wonderful foundation stone laying ceremony that we had. And I remember the barren land that we had, yes, you see, Father, yeah, yeah, 17 yeah. acres yes. of just a vacant yes. barren land. And today you see so many buildings. So what many, a change within so these happy few years. Places, Father. Yeah, that's I true. Think, I think that's the most important thing, making people happy. We have, we have about 3,200 students and about 140 faculty members, right. another 100 non-teaching staff. Mm -hmm. And I see them every day with cheerful faces. Wow. And if I don't see their faces cheerful, I ask them why, what happened? Anything wrong in the family? Anything wrong personally? So we, in fact, as it happens in St. Xavier's College in Park Street, we also want to have a cheerful Xavierian family here. Right. This is our, uh, you know, mm. aim to have. Because once you have a Xavierian family sharing your ideas, sharing, sharing your life, and sharing your mission, mm -hmm. and with so many students, you know, teaching them, learning. It's a pleasant job. It's a beautiful job. It's a mission. I, I don't call it a profession, right, but it Father. is a mission. Yeah. Yes. And it must be the most satisfying thing for you, Father. You know, teaching has always been a satisfying mission for me. As a Jesuit, I'm a Jesuit. Right. I am not a lay person mm -hmm. in the, let us say, other side of the life. But I am a Jesuit, I am a religious, I am a priest. And so I see this as a mission, not as a profession. I am not here just because I get salary. I am not here because I get name or fame. I am here because God has sent me to be his instrument in touching the lives and hearts of people, students especially. Because these are students entrusted to you for their formation, for their future. So you will have to form them, train them, make them competent, make them so that they are able to fit into the larger society. Now they will go after the four walls of a classroom. Right, they will get into the market. Yeah. They will get into industries. They will get into business. They will get into married life. And so how to handle oneself, how to handle others, how to make good decisions. So this is what it is. So I always consider it as a mission. And this mission so far has been very successful, very fruitful, very meaningful. So, Father, on this note, my mind, my mind wants to ask you, how important is spirituality in the field of education? Every field has a spirituality. Absolutely. You see, every religion has its own spirituality. Yes. You call yes. it Christian spirituality, Hindu spirituality, Sikh spirituality, or Muslim Islam spirituality. So every religion has its own spirituality, right. okay? Right. But in the education also, unless and until you have faith in God, because I believe in God, right. and I am here to fulfill my mission because I believe that this mission is not something that I acquired. Maybe I have the talents. Maybe I have the managing or organizing ability. But all these talents are gifts of God. And so you have to use these gifts uh, for the greater glory of God. That's our motto. Yes. yes. You know, Absolutely. as they say, AMDG, ad mayorum, deu gloriam. So all that you do, you do it for the greater glory of God. That's what it is. Right. And so we, in fact, have three to ten days of induction mm -hmm. every year when we begin the academic session. And during that induction, we tell our students, you see, this is a campus in which there is sacredness. As soon as you enter, you must experience the sacredness of the environment. Here is a campus, not that God is not present anywhere, Absolutely. He is present everywhere. Yes, yes, yes. But we make this environment conducive so that every student who enters experiences the presence of the divine. So I always say, the patron saint of this campus is St. Francis Xavier, right, Father, yes. now, who came here 500 years ago from yes. some country. Yes. He could have been a great intellectual. But poor man gave up all these ambitions and came to India to preach the gospel, 
and then he started the first college. Right. And that first college was the foundation of now. We have 76 Jesuit colleges in this country yeah. and three universities. Yeah. And so the Jesuit educational system is one of the very powerful, very meaningful uh, system that contributes a lot, you know, in the field of both school education as well as in the higher education. So for me, spirituality is important. Today you ask in the West, what religion do you belong to? Mm. Any student in any campus, mm. they don't say I belong to this religion, that religion. They say my religion is spirituality. Yeah, yes. You see, there is a difference between religion and spirituality. Absolutely right. Father. You can be spiritual without a religion. Correct, yes. Father, yes. But you need not to be spiritual, yeah. but you can be a religious. Yes. You see? Yes. I mean, you are supposed to have spirituality as a religious. Yeah. But there may be people who belong to some religions, but who may not have spirituality at all. Right. So it all depends on your faith in God, your belief in God, and the way you live your life. Yeah. Spirituality is very important, and that dimension is very much emphasized in this institution, as it is being done in any Jesuit institution. So, Father, you have been involved in so many education initiatives throughout your life, throughout your career. So where do you get this passion for this transformative education? And the reason I'm saying transformative because you have actually transformed the education dynamics in Kolkata at least or in West Bengal per se. Okay. Maybe there are many reasons for it. Right. Why I came into teaching, why I came into education, particularly higher education. Mm. Uh, number one, my own family is a family of teachers. Right. My parents were teachers. My brother was a teacher. Mm. And so that is number, the family background. Secondly, after I joined the Jesuit order, uh, my superiors told me, I think you have a, a leaning towards teaching, mm -hmm. towards intellectual apostolate. Mm -hmm. So why don't you train yourself mm -hmm. uh, to be a teacher in St. Xavier's College? That's how I landed up in yeah. St. Xavier's College. Yeah. Now I have spent 33 yeah. years in St. Xavier's College, you know, and then six years now in this university. So I discovered myself that teaching is a mission which puts you in touch with hundreds of students. They are given to you and they depend on you. They have their freedom, definitely. But you are teaching them, you are forming them to be full human beings. You know, that uh, an integrated formation that you give. It's not just one. It's physical, it's spiritual, it is academic an all-round formation training that you give it to students. Right. And when a student after a few years, you know, comes back to you and says, thank you yeah, for yes. what you have been. Yes. And that's the greatest thing that can happen in your life. And I've had so many. Okay? I, I, I know that. I, yes. I, I meet yes. them here yes. and there, yes. everywhere. Yes. And uh, it's not just the expression of uh, gratitude, but my life has transformed their life. So the whole question of transformative dimension of teaching, of education. Yes. See, education for me is meaningful if it can transform students, if it can give them certain aims in life, if it can help them to grow. You know, there should be a mental change. There must be physical change. There must be spiritual change. So they must become people who live with their hearts, not with their minds, mm, right. you know. It should not be skin deep. It should be, you know, we always say we love with our hearts, not with our minds. And so if life can be based on love, not on likes, there is a tremendous amount of difference between likes and, love. and loves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so we love, need yeah. to, we need to depend on love. Our relationship must be based on love. And not on just likes. Likes are very temporary. Because this is this will change. Fade away. Yeah, fade, fade away. away. But the love remains always. always. So if an educational institution can become a center of love, center of care, that's why the Jesuits say now cura personalis. Mm -hmm. That is care for every individual student. Mm -hmm. No poor student should just walk away and say, I cannot study in St. Xavier's. Mm -hmm. That should not happen. Every student should have. Of course, we select on merit, but there may be students who may not have the meritorious, you know, 
uh, uh, the marks for admission, but there may be some poor students, village students, first generation students. You must identify them and bring them to the institution and educate them. These are the people who will be grateful to you. Right. Yeah. So, Father, um, as a vice chancellor of such a great university, how do you think universities play a role in general, not just in Jeeva University, but in general around India and the country and the world in uh, making a social change and bringing the social development? See, I remember what uh, the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, said. Every educational institution is a temple of knowledge. Yes. And every village is a temple of prosperity. So the importance that we have to give to education, whether it is a school or college or university, every educational institution has its significant role to play. The same way, if there are no villages mm. tomorrow, mm. we will all go hungry. Yes, you know, if there are no farmers in the villages, yeah. if there are no people who don't cultivate, mm. that's all gone. The future is dark. And so educational institutions and the villages are very important. So I always promote this college to village, village to college. Yes. Now here we what we have is village to university, university to village. Yeah. Our students and faculty members must be exposed to the villages. Village parents and village children must be exposed to the university because they must come and see our students studying in the classrooms. They must come and see the building. They must come and see the facilities. You know, people who are living in the villages, right. they may not have seen universities. Right. When they see, they get an idea. Right. Why can't tomorrow I be a student right. of this university? This is the transformative, right. you know, uh, dimension of life that happens here. Right. And so every university, every school, every college, every university has a role to play. Right. What did Jawaharlal Nehru say? He said the destiny of this country is in the classrooms. Right. So if everything goes well with a school, with a college, with a university, everything will go well in this country. But what we are learning is sometimes we need to unlearn. You see, yeah. uh, what we are learning is not on the whole in general helpful because there are students who are joining politics. That's not the time to join politics. Mm -hmm. We must be political, of course, definitely. We must analyze politics. We must assess what is going on outside. But we cannot enter into active politics because uh, one like in the political side and one like in the institutional side. So you don't do justice to both, you see. So you complete your education and then if you have a choice to join politics, politics is not bad. Nobody says, because we don't like politicians, because we think all politicians are corrupt. No, it need not to be. And so our students should not enter into party politics when they are in the colleges and universities. They must enter into party politics. They must enter into politics, active politics, because they must learn well in the institutions and they must project it in their life outside afterwards. We need good leaders right. all over the world, not only in our country. We need everywhere good leaders, good leaders whom we can follow, good leaders whose values will influence us, good leaders for the people who are people oriented, people's welfare oriented. This is what we lack. And the universities and colleges must prepare these good leaders. This is what uh, the mission of the universities and colleges is. And that's the main purpose. And so we want to make every Jesuit institution as a transformative institution. So six years we have completed now here. In these six years, I'm trying my level best with all the stakeholders. First, of course, student community. Second, faculty members, non-teaching staff the parents of our students, the alumni, alumni, and then our benefactors and friends, all must join together and then accomplish this mission. This right. is what it is. Father, during your tenure of as the principal of St. Xavier's College, you launched a number of uh, new courses, yes. a lot of new things inside yes. the college. Which one, again, you cannot choose, but mm -hmm. I'll put you on the spot again. Which one do you consider? Well, that's very easy for me. To consider the most easy. impactful yeah. and why? I, I, I was at St. Xavier's for 33 years. Right. I was there as a teacher. I was there as a vice principal. I was there as a rector. 
and I was there as a uh, principal. So all these have taken me to a number of developments. Uh, there were two sides of St. Xavier's College's growth. One is the physical growth. The second is the academic growth. Okay. Now, in terms of physical growth, uh, we started uh, buildings, classrooms, renovating them, making more classrooms, shifting departments to different buildings. So much of expansion took place. The academic growth, we added more departments, more courses. PhD was introduced by me in the college. And then many MA programs, postgraduate programs were introduced. We started a new hostel for girls yes. and boys. But the best of it is our expansion to a village called Raghapur. Uh, yes, yes, That is the greatest achievement that we have had. The faculty members participated in it. Alumni, alumni participated in it. All the Jesuit fathers participated in it. So it was like a Zaverian family thinking together and saying, we want to accomplish something. So we started a campus in that remote village. Today there are 800 students. And out of these 800, 650 of them are girls. And these girls would not have gone to any other college if we had not started this college. So today we have in Raghapur, which is just about 25, 30 kilometers away from Park Street. So we have a campus of St. Xavier's College. I didn't want to make it a separate college right, father. because yes. ah. now they will have in their certificates, mm. in their mark sheets, yeah. St. Xavier's College yeah. Park Street yeah. stamp, yes, you know, yeah. campus. Yeah. So that's how now 800 students and this, had brought, this has brought in a lot of change in that loca locality, in that village and also the villages around. Why? The whole South 24 Parganas has changed because of this. The two buildings that we put up. Right, father. These are the tallest buildings in the whole of South 24 Bagana district. So that's how we changed life. And that is, for me, a very meaningful, uh, let's say, for instance, close to the heart experience that I've had. Right. But during your career, you've been uh, awarded with so many awards and accolades. So uh, how do you think these awards and accolades have further pushed you into the path of excellence? Or... Like, do these awards do not mean that much to you? It's the no, work that means. They don't mean much to me. Yes, the state government uh, gave me two awards. Bongo Bibushan and yeah, yes. uh, Sheikh Sharatna. Yeah. The awards are public recognitions, which is true. I agree that the awards tell you that you have contributed something. Okay. But the awards maybe give you a lot of support give you encouragement and the, encourage, the recognition gives you a lot of uh, you know appreciation uh, but somehow the award has not made much of a change in my life awards come and go okay when when one new award comes you forget about the old award <laughs> now what do you do with that but for me the uh, the force the strength uh, that has been my commitment to God. Right. And my leader always has been Jesus Christ. And I have seen that in our founder, St. Ignatius of Loyola. And now the patron saint, St. Francis Xavier. Now these have been people whose lives have impressed me, transformed me and changed my life. I have always asked this question. If Francis Xavier could come, he could have been a famous professor in the University of Paris. And if that man could just easily give away that, give up that, yeah. and come over to India and do this, why not we? And that's one of the reasons why I came all the way from Tamil Nadu 50 years ago and settled down in Bengal. You see. And that's what it is. Awards, okay, they're good because you get public recognition. Public recognition always good. One thing I want to tell you this, Indians are highly negative. They are pessimistic, critical. As uh, Amartya Sen says, we are all argumentative. Yeah. Uh, you take a small little topic and you have big argument on that. Right. This is what it is. And so when there is public recognition, public appreciation, it's always good. People must be recognized. 
people must be awarded people must be appreciated because this is a human appreciation element of life uh, but somehow i have not given much importance to that i would like to of course definitely recognize people i would like to appreciate people if that appreciation recognition happens life will be different but we are doing very little of appreciation you see we are highly critical criticism is good but we are destructively critical not constructively right, right. critical uh, yes you see uh, yes. it's always good to be self critical to be always good to be critical of others also but we must be constructively critical you know so in fact what uh, plato said you know if you want to of course help somebody don't be negative always be positive the positive approach builds people but negative approach kills people this is where it is yes. so father you said you come you come all the way from down south now you into the eastern part of india and uh, you have traveled a lot of landscape you've seen and you've met a lot of people mm-hmm. from different sect different society so when you meet so many people i'm sure you learn something from every one of them so how how has your experience been meeting people from so many different sects different parts of the country i i i always believe that uh, the world is one family okay uh, that's what tagu said and that what hindu scriptures yes. say okay and uh, since the world is one family whether you know the person or you don't know the person whether he or she lives in united states or lives in some other country there is always this what you call cordless connection as human beings we are all the same maybe i may know by name by face a couple of thousands but uh, today you have about uh, so many people in this in this country and so many people in the world it's almost how many uh 8 billion yes, more than 8 yeah, billion yeah, yeah. so i don't know everyone uh-huh. but somehow as human beings mm-hmm. god has made this cordless relationship with one another right. so the more people you meet the richer you become right. you know right. you reach out to people uh, maybe for various reasons i have met alumni i have met so many people uh, i have met people who have helped me who have learned from me i have learned from them and so if one grows with a sense that the world is a family right you know you must keep your doors and windows open fresh air must come yeah. in gore vaire <laughs> this is what tagore yeah. wrote you know yeah. he said the world is one family yeah. let's just reach out to others so for me my travels with the alumni and my travels to other institutions i, well. I have taught there yeah. i have lived there yeah. but it has always been a very enriching experience i have learned a lot right that's right. true so father from trichy all the way to kolkata how did this journey happen <laughs> it was not uh, my decision i always believe it was god's decision or rather i could say it was god's decision in the person of lord ganesh really father yeah. <laughs> you know what happened i was studying in uh, st joseph's college trishnapalli so i found a foreigner standing at the main door uh, so something urged me go and find out uh, what he is looking for so i went to him and i said what are you looking for he looked at that uh, rock mm. temple mm. and said i want to go and visit that rock temple mm. so i asked you oh, sure you can go i can take you there mm. but i found out he was a jesuit okay yes okay. he told me that i'm living here uh-huh. so tomorrow you come and take me so i took him the next day and while we were walking he asked me a number of questions and it's 144 steps you have to mm. climb up mm. to the lord ganesh temple mm. so we climbed up and at the entrance normally you find in many temples earlier but not now mm. you may find even now mm. dogs and christians are not allowed inside yeah. it's there in puri it's still there it's there in puri so it is it is their belief mm. okay so then this foreigner told me i cannot go inside but i said come come let's go who's going to stop us so i pulled them and went we went inside nobody stopped us anything nothing happened nobody questioned us 
and so while we were returning he told me you are a brave boy you should have guts to take me inside especially i'm a foreigner so while you're returning he told me have you visited calcutta i said no oh it's a land of tagore land of mother teresa land of this so please come that's what it is so after my puc that's first year of my studies i changed my mind i said i'll go to calcutta so that's how i came uh, but speaking of mother teresa how important has her teachings been in your life i was very close to her and i have written a lot about mother teresa about her life about her mission about her work and i have given also like this interviews to europe and to united states about mother teresa one day i went to meet her and i was told she was in retreat in silence she cannot meet you so i said doesn't matter you just tell her that i have come from st david's college so one sister went and told her she came down so i asked her but you are supposed to be in silence doesn't matter i want i'm meeting a priest i'm meeting god you see wow. that wow you see every human person wow. is an image of god representative yes. of god correct and so i have a priest with me right now so i'm speaking to god i'm not speaking to anybody else it's not a distraction to me it's rather in its inspiration to me You see, this is what it is. You know, that lady was deeply spiritual. Yes, and uh, she has. We were. I invited her for a youth festival. She came, and we were talking there. Yeah. She prayed, and then encouraged the youth to pray. Yeah. And so she has transformed. You know, the life of individuals, life of communities. Why the life of Calcutta, the life of even India. She has had her share. Absolutely. She has had her share. Absolutely. You see, my question is this: If Mother Teresa had been in Mumbai, mm. or if she had been in uh, Chennai or Delhi, she wouldn't have become famous. Why do that? Bengal is special. You know that. It's in Bengal we have goddesses, Durga, Kali Mata. So we give importance to goddesses, not in other places. and so a woman is worshipped a goddess is worshipped so that's why we have pujas you know so this is wow. a dimension <laughs> if only she had been there she wouldn't have become even a saint i am convinced of it it's because she was in kolkata she was in bengal the bengal people knew who she was and they were with her they recognized her that's a huge thing to say father they elevated her wow. you know that yeah, yeah, yeah. it's bengal that elevated her it's the people of calcutta that's why we call it city of joy yeah father you see so she shared the joy of kolkata and kolkata shared her joy yeah. it's a mutual sharing of joys that's what it is but she was a great lady for me yes uh, father you were also involved in the west bengal education commission as well so father what were the what were some key recommendations that you gave them to change the education sector's road map or the journey for obviously for better yeah way. you see education needs continuous changes it cannot just be stable like say for instance uh, we made some changes and then the west bengal government introduced from school level to university level certain changes now the central government has come with new education policy 2020 now according to that from this year all undergraduate courses going to be four year courses yeah, yes father yeah, yeah. Okay. now it has got of course different schemes within that uh, you can exit after 3 years you get a degree called uh, with major or you can finish 4 years with the honors degree mm. so there are various schemes within the system so now educational system it needs to be assessed every time and uh, it needs to be uh, revised renewed and then new things need to be brought why every country doesn't have the same system absolutely true yes so now united states system is different from ours yeah. uh, if a student from here goes after 3 years mm. of degree mm. he has to do one year of post graduation yes. there in order to qualify mm. so that you can do post graduate studies mm. there mm. now if it is 4 years here mm. now we can straight go for uh, post graduate studies to united ah. states or even with this new education policy a student who completes 4 years mm. with additional credits 
of research, he can straight go for PhD. So, so many provisions that, you know, so education keeps changing. And so every education commission like us, we were at, we were a commission appointed by the state government. So we studied the whole uh, situation, scenario of education from school level to uh, college level. And we recommended that if you can do this, if you can review, if you can revise syllabus, if you can uh, uh, revise the whole curriculum, things would be much better. So our government responded to that, yes. Rather, what is your personal opinion on this new education uh, system that is coming to, sp especially the four-year bachelor of degree course, Rather? I would say it is, it is falling in line with the global system. Right, Rather. Okay. I think if you want to have one system for the whole country, it is beneficial for us. A student can migrate from West Bengal to Tamil Nadu or from Tamil Nadu to Maharashtra, Bihar. So, it, it possibility is there. So, if you have one system in which you have so many credits, so many subjects, so many courses, you know, it is a, a uniform, not exactly uniform, identical, but certain uniform system in which our students are educated, it's easier for them to understand. Otherwise, you see, the education is in the concurrent list. Both central government is also in charge, responsible, and state governments also as well. So there is a confusion between these two. And this confusion uh, should be solved as early as possible, you see. So state governments are completely responsible for primary education, school. That's why you have state universities. Ah, right. You have state private universities. Yes. So the new education policy introduces certain new schemes which are good. And it is also giving certain amount of freedom for private universities, private initiatives. See, what has happened in our country, there are so many government universities, state government universities, central government, central universities. Now, there are very few of them doing very well. Most of them in terms of standard, in terms of excellence, in terms of functioning, they are very poor. But private universities, of course, they have their commercial, mm -hmm. commercial right. uh, expectations, right. commercial. Right. But at the same time, private universities, because of competitions, they are trying to deliver quality education. Not all, but at least most of them trying to deliver. So in that sense, the new education policy has introduced certain schemes which are good. But it has also, of course, has got certain drawbacks. So... Already, you see, state governments are not agreeing with center. And the center is not taking a bold step. So it is not even an act. It is only what you call uh, a policy that has been approved by the cabinet. It didn't go to the parliament. Right. Parliament did not pass it. So there are uh, strengths and weaknesses of this policy. But I'm sure uh, once the scheme is introduced, it might help students. It might help the whole education system. Yes. Father, you've been the director of the Gotu's Indian Library and Research Society. How important do you view the matters of research and knowledge dissemination in the Indian society? Because, in my opinion, what I have seen in the professional sphere, once we are out of the education, because I feel college and university is a very protected environment. Mm. The minute you go to your work environment, it's not as protective. Mm. You know, everybody is a hawk. They want to come at you. People who are good at research, is this my personal opinion, <clears throat> people who are good at research, they somehow excel better than the ones who aren't, who don't believe in the power of research. What is your take on it? Which is true. You are very right. Because research is one important element of any educational institutions. You don't start research outside in the business world industry. Right, you start research right, right. in your classroom. This is being emphasized now by this new education policy. Now, what is wrong with our whole education system? Our system is bookish. Our system is theory-based. We don't expect our students to go to industries and have internship or some experience. Uh, they must be open to, you know, it must be both theoretical and practical. This is what is coming to now. And they must go to research, involved with some business houses, industries. Suppose a commerce student. He must go into the commercial world or a science student. He must go into the scientific field 
and be exposed. He learns a lot by exposure. So the research attitude approach must begin right from undergraduate level. You must have an orientation for research. Without orientation, suddenly you ask the man to enter. The second thing is this. A student who passes out BA, BSc, BCom from our universities is not fit in the market. Most of the companies say he is not fit. He is only theoretical, no practical knowledge. So they give in-house formation mm -hmm. for six months, one year, two years. No, that's not necessary. Yeah. So there is no what you call this interface yeah. between educational institutions and industries, right. business houses. Yes. See, in the United States, mm. business houses support educational institutions even by finance. Oh, is it? Foundations. They give scholarships. They help institutions. So this is what has happened. There is always this connect between industries and education, which is not in our country. And uh, in our country, and industries are separate. They are by themselves. Educational institutions are by, them, by themselves. So we are we are functioning independently, you know, without any connect, without any interface. So this new policy is bringing out this interface. Some institutions are definitely following in terms of MOUs with other universities, in terms of doing common research okay, with other universities, which is all good. But the whole question of research orientation, attitude, approach must start from the college or from the universities. Then only it will give you an opening to do research when you are employed in an industry. Then you are thinking, okay, I can do this, I can do that. Whether it be a scientific industry, whether it be a commercial industry, business, whichever it is, that you would be creative. So our students are not employable. You see, we are only talking in terms of employment. Mm. How many are employed? Yeah. No, we are not talking in terms of employability. Suppose if 100 students are passing out from an institution, are all the 100 employable? No, there will be very few. The rest are all jumping, I mean, walking up and down to the industries, looking for jobs. So the employability is the question. Not the number of employments. So if this is answered, if this is addressed, definitely things will change. Yes. Father, you have uh, authored and co-authored a lot of books, Father. Coming to this research point, I'm sure you also personally do a lot of research before you start writing a book, Father. And how intensive <laughs> is that? Today, successful people are those who are multitask oriented. You just can't be doing one thing at a time, you know. You must think differently uh, about many things. While you are teaching, you should also write. While you are writing, you should also do some research. While you are researching, you should also join somebody and ask him or her to join you in the research work. While you are doing educational work, you also do some social work. Because you are meant for people outside. So your life must become sort of an integrated life. Oh, I am only teaching, so I will only teach. Otherwise, that work, that work, that work is a disturbance. No, that's not that. And so research must go with teaching. Research must go with certain social apostolate work. Research must go with the community buildings and development. And all our research must be oriented for the growth and welfare of our people. Now. At least 60 to 70 percent of our research is for the sake of publication. Right, Father. Yes. Because you are asked to do it. Mm -hmm. So there are some people who do research and publish it by paying money. It's, it's happening. Right. And that's why so many publication houses are thriving now. Mm -hmm. You pay me 5,000, I'll publish your paper. This is what is happening. So we are not, in fact, in research very genuine, very hardworking. We are finding easy ways out. Uh, the shortcuts. Yeah, say. shortcut, uh, ready-made. Uh, yes. Today, the world is a ready-made world. Mm. They want shortcut answers. They want instant food. They want answers immediately to the question paper. You see? So they have all types of uh, system to find answers. Google. 
So they don't want to work. They don't want to research. They just want an answer from the Google. This is what life has become. You know, whether it is food, instant food. Whether it is exam, instant answers, ready-made answers. So our life has become not deep. Our life has become not depth-oriented. Has our life become shallow? Life has become very shallow. But at the same time, today's generation is more intelligent than us. They know many things. We don't know how to operate a computer. We have to learn. But today, a child is able to operate Absolutely. a computer. So yes. the general knowledge, the aptitude, things have changed. But at the same time, possibly you ask him two plus two, how much? The student will ask for a calculator. I don't know two plus two. <laughs> this is where it is. So yeah. intelligence is weak, but the general GK is very broad. Father, I know what you will answer, but I'll still ask you: Can there ever be a shortcut to success? No. Never ever. No. Shortcut to success, then we say it is a uh, luck. Yeah, yeah. They say it's luck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't believe in luck. You see, it's like this: what Lord Krishna told uh, Arjuna. You see, Arjuna asked Lord Krishna, "Why life is so difficult? I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to be honest, but my life is difficult. That fellow is a cheat, and he is enjoying life." He said, "Yes, yes. Now listen." Diamond. If you want to make the diamond into a lovely ornament, it has to go through some frictions. Otherwise, you can't do it. It has to be cut. Or gold, the raw gold. If you want to make it as an ornament, is there a ring or a necklace? It has to go through the fire. You see. And so, every good person goes through difficult life to become stronger. But every weak person goes through luxuries to become weaker. Wow! And so finally, life is richer. Finally, see, we all believe I am truthful, I am honest, but I am suffering in life. No, God doesn't want you to suffer. He rather gives you opportunities to become stronger. And suffering is not permanent. It passing. You see, any suffering for that matter, any depression. Any downflow life, it's not permanent. It is, it's temporary. It's passing. At the same time, luxury in life, enjoyment in life is also not permanent. You see, so people think that material accumulation, okay, is is all enjoyment. No, it's not that. It is here. You may be the wealthiest man in the world, but at the same time, you may not be able to sleep at night. So what happens to you? Suppose you are the wealthiest man in the in, in in the world, and you have some serious sickness. Who heals you? Absolutely. You have to Absolutely. depend on somebody. Absolutely. You have to depend on God. Yes. And so this is what life is. You know, if only people can understand what life is. I'll just I'll just quote for you yes. one great philosopher's quotation. He has written a book called The Hymn of the Universe. Okay. okay? It's a famous book. The hymn of the universe means the whole universe is singing a song, and nobody listens to that. Nobody hears that song. It's only the person who is attuned with the universe, the person who can appreciate sun, moon, person who can appreciate birds and talk to birds and trees. It is that person who can listen to that song. The hymn is being sung all through every time, but people who listen to this live a meaningful life. So he says, "We are all spiritual beings with a human nature." I must. We are all spiritual beings with human nature. We are not human beings with spiritual nature. Wow! What a line! You see, what a strong line. But. Today, ninety-nine percent of people live as if we are human beings with spiritual nature. Why? We don't pray. We don't think of God unless uh, unless you fall sick. You don't think of God unless in your family somebody is sick. Then you call God, 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 please. Otherwise, you are enjoying life. Your life is very skin deep. You are only bothered about what color you are. What type of clothes you have to wear? What type of food you have to wear? 
and what type of hotels that you have to go. So we are all busy with all these mundane things. We seldom give time to remember God, to be thankful of Him for the gifts that He has given. This is what happens. So spirituality has become weak. Human dimension of life, the flesh dimension of life, temporary, transitory dimension of life has become very important. So Father, what about those people who are not religious or who do not believe in God? So what will, what, what are the There messages? is no one in this world who can say he doesn't or she doesn't believe in but God. But they call themselves atheist Father. I can call myself an atheist. The very, very fact you are alive because there is God. Now, you can explain God in different ways. You can call him Allah, you can call him Ram, you can call him Yahweh, you can call him Jesus Christ, you can call him anything, any name. So, God has no one name. God has got many names. Okay. So, there cannot be in principle an atheist. He may say for reasons which he knows that he is an atheist. All the Marxists said they are atheists. But they are their own belief. Personal life was different. They had their personal life and public life. Yeah. yeah. And so this is what basically is. So for me, there is no atheist who can deny the existence of God. There is always God. Yes. And so the experience of God is a tremendous amount of uh, uh, meaning in life that a person who experiences... No, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, Sridi Sai Baba. You know, such a wonderful man that he was. See, for me, it's like this. A spiritual person is a miraculous person. A spiritual person can transform others' lives. A spiritual person knows what is going to happen, not only to him, but also to other persons. So that is why Jesus Christ said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure of heart, they shall see God. So if only a person is pure of heart, very pure, he can see God. Otherwise, it's very difficult to see God. You see, this is what life is. Father, you mentioned social work some time back. You've been in involved with Snegam, which is an NGO. And you've done a lot of social activity, Father. Uh, what is What was your most memorable thing that you did? And... How much love do you derive while doing this? And how important yeah. is it to you? I was with Snegam, which is an NGO. Now with Snegam mm -hmm. and with our students in St. Javier's College, we started what you call that project, Prayas Project. That's called Village to College, College to Village. So I wanted transformation on both sides. The college students also must be transformed. The village children also must be transformed. And both have to be involved in this. And this is what Prayas was. Yeah. And so students came forward and said, we'll contribute one rupee a day. Yeah. And this is called one rupee revolution. Yeah. We'll contribute one rupee a day. Yeah. And we put all that money into the villages. Yeah. Buy uniform for children. Yeah. Buy books for children. And build a small little hall for children in the villages. And they did that. That was a wonderful experience that we had, you know. And the quality of education of those children, at least at that time when we were there, about 3,000 children, nice, the quality of their learning, mm. quality of their education completely changed. Mm. So other villages started inviting us, mm. please send your students to our village mm. because they are teaching our children well. Mm. What is not happening in the classroom mm. is happening in the common, in the village. So this is how, you know, we transformed. And that was wonderful. And that continues in the college. Now I've introduced it in the in the university. Here it is university to village, village to the university. So that social dimension is very important in any student's life. Like say, for instance, I come to St. Davies University or St. Davies College or any educational institution. If I am cut off from the realities of the world, Reality is what's going on outside. Yeah. Then I am in, uh, in a, within the four walls of a classroom. And who am I learning for? Why am I studying for? What is my life? What am I going to do? Just earn some money 
and live a happy life? No. I have to be connected with people outside. When we started this university, when the Honorable Chief Minister laid the foundation and also inaugurated it, I called the Panchayati leaders of these villages. I told them, come, this university will do something for you. And that's how we did so many projects. We had Shishumela, we brought the children of these villages. We went to these villages, we adopted six villages. We said, we are responsible for the transformation of your children. And so this last week, we had a program called the tailoring program. So we selected 15 women from these villages. We asked the West Bengal Electricity Supply Board to sponsor this project. And uh, we had a 10-day training program for these 15 women. We bought through the support, sponsorship, 15 machines, shoeing machines. And they learned from it and we gave the machines to them. And said, now you set up a little shop in your village, you earn, you do that. And then we are going to do that continuously now. Every semester we'll have one project and then do that. So social dimension of life is very important in every human person's life, especially in students' life. Because that brings in a lot of transformation in the lives of students. I'll give you just a small little incident that happened. One of our students on Sunday, he came. So I asked him, what are you doing on a Sunday? He said, no, I'm going to that village. Why? He said, no, I have fallen in love with those children. I like them. And what are you carrying? I'm carrying some chocolate, some sandwiches, some water bottles, all this. And you know, the same boy, when he went first to that village, his mother told him, don't drink water there. Don't touch the children there. Don't drink, uh, don't eat any food there. This was <laughs> And he went with that idea and then he got transformed, you see that, not today. So this is what is happening in life. Right. Yes. Father, your specialization in economics and you being your background as a priest may seem like contrasting fields. How do you reconcile the two aspects of your identity? Uh, the mission of a priest is not just exclusive, right. it's inclusive. Right. And so a priest can be anywhere. Mm -hmm. You have Jesuits who are actors. Mm. Uh, you have Jesuits who are scientists. Right. You have Jesuits who are writers. Mm. You have Jesuits in economics, in, uh, in commerce. Mm. So you have priests everywhere. So not that I wanted to be an economist. Mm. But my superiors asked me, mm. I think you'll have to teach in the college. You take economics and go. Mm. So I did it. Mm. And then I found myself later that I had, I had a liking. I had some talent for economics. So I studied myself, did my post-graduation and then PhD. My specialization is development. Right. Yeah. And in fact, I have written on this. Amartya Sen, mm. is he? I like him. Now, he has written recently a book called Development as Freedom. Right. Very famous book. He has written many books. One of them is this, the recent. Now, I wrote to go one step further. Mm. Development is not freedom. Development is liberation. All right. So you bring in the difference between freedom and liberation. You see, not all free people are liberated. But all liberated people are free. Suppose, say for instance, Mr. X can call himself free. He can do anything he wants. But is he liberated? He may be a slave to some of the values that he has. He may be a slave to something that within himself, in his personal life, or maybe in his personal relationship with people. So, you need to be liberated internally and externally. You need to be a person who is just free, cheerful, you know. You need to be a God-oriented person and people-oriented person. Not, not hang-ups, you know, doubt, serious, this, that, anger, hatred. These are all things that bondage us, you know. They control us. So this is where. So I wanted to take development as liberation. Right. 
So I have written on that and I'm still improving on that. Bring out the difference between freedom and liberation and uh, how they are defined and then say, if you're talking about development, you see development has gone through a process. We thought development means economic growth. Then we said, no, 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 development means various other things. Right. We took only GDP, GNP, yeah, yeah, per capita right. income <laughs> to measure development. Yeah. But today it is happiness is being yes, taken as yes, development. Yes, yes. You see, uh, in, in um, Bhutan, yeah. they are saying happiness is the parameter for development. If people are happy, we are developed. You see? So things are changing, changing. today. Right. So in that sense, I'm saying, like say for instance, an educated country or a country with high level of education is a developed country. A country with high level of values is a developed country. Take United States, take Switzerland, take uh, any other European country. It's high level of values. Honesty is there, integrity is there, trust is there. If you call any Silicon Valley employee, uh, why are you developing so well? It, mm. He would definitely say it's because of integrity. We are people with integrity. We don't say lies. We don't cheat. We don't do anything. We just work. We do. That's why United States flourishes so much. But there are countries which do not flourish, which do not develop. But the level of hatred, dislikeness, communal tendencies, fights, yes. violence, yes. 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 destruction, yes. Yes. burning of things, yes. it's very high. Yes. Why? It's because we don't have values. Mm. I'll give you an example. You are driving your car, you come to a signal, it's a red light, but you are so impatient, you're honking, can, 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 pee, 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 pee. No values. You see? Or you break the line and then you go because no police is there. So we are people who are aggressive, you know. And that aggressiveness will not let us live a happy life. This is what. So there are countries which are developed, which have high values, which are high education, are developed. But there are countries which have very low level of education, literacy is low, and they are poor countries. So that's why developed countries, developing countries, underdeveloped countries, poor yeah. countries, rich countries. So this is what is happening today. This has to change. That's why I say, if people are liberated, if people feel free, there is no poor and rich, there is no slave and master, but we are all equals. There is no high caste and low caste, but we are all equals. If this happens, then development is liberation. Father, could you share us a uh, the personal mantra that has helped you as a leader and helped you in a decision making process personal, for, for mm. every entrepreneur <clears throat> father, or yeah. everybody in general? True. Uh, for me, what we call this personal mantra is the discernment. Now, discernment is a process, a praxis. Now, this process is to weigh and see pros and cons. I have to take a decision with regard to an individual or with regard to an institution or with regard to an event, let's say. Now, I have to weigh and see what are the pros and cons. If I do this, Will it do good? If I do this, will it be harmful? So I cannot make a decision in one moment. I need to give time. That is why, what do they call? Examine your conscience. You see? Suppose, say for instance, you run half a kilometer and then you put your hand, palm on your chest. Your heart beats so faster. Yes. The same thing happens even if you don't run. But if I say a lie to you, yes, sir. suppose say, I yes, say a yes, lie, yes, yes, okay, yeah. and the heart beats are faster. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because I know uh, I have said a lie to you. I have not spoken the truth. Faster. Immediately you put your hand, palm, and then it says, it says you have said a lie, you have said a lie, you have said a lie. Till you rectify, it will go on like this. This is life, is you know. And so one has to take his time. Analyze and see what decision you are taking. Is it a, a God 
based decision is the spirit working that see there is bad spirit and good spirit are you led by good spirit or are you led by bad spirit the bad spirit may say no go ahead do it you are powerful you can do anything you want but the good spirit say go slow take your time so this is what it is like say for instance a drop of water can fall on uh, cotton when a drop of water falls on cotton what happens the cotton becomes wet cotton becomes wet right. but there is no uh, noise yes father right it just absorbs yes father but suppose a drop of water falls on a rock yeah, it makes it noise. spills yes father yeah yeah this is what it is so when you are making a good decision it's like a drop of water falling on a cotton very quiet doesn't disturb but what happens is when you are noisy when you are no i must teach him a lesson i will take this decision i'll punish him a drop of water falling on the rock it spills it doesn't stay this is what basically is many people do not know how to make a decision we must learn there are managerial techniques mm. but managerial techniques are very external mm. but for me is the spiritual dimension of life it is god who will guide you who will lead you it is god spirit who is the secret of all success because he is the one who has made you he is the one who has created you he knows much better than anybody else he knows what you must think what you must do how you must accomplish life every success of your life depends on god this is what it is because we think everything depends on me uh, we very little give recognition acceptance and uh, value to god we think i can do everything but that's what is the wrong you know this this will spoil our life and so for me you have to be spiritual you have to know how the spirit is leading you you have to discern weigh and see the pros and cons and then make a decision properly right yes that is a mantra right father you also worked with the bengal economic association which is uh, <clears throat> giving you a lot of insights into the economic uh, situation mm. the condition of our state what do you believe are the are some of the key issues that need to be addressed by the west bengal given yes. the state that it is in currently in terms of see, the industry and yeah the that's true it is it is very true it is a long history yes. no one individual or no one government can be blamed for Absolutely. this but then for the last 30 40 years i think we have we have suffered you see bengal is an exemplary state to the whole country in terms of the hard work in terms of academic achievement you take uh, the field of economics i think almost all the economists are found here <laughs> yeah other nobel laureates are all here yes. nowhere else yes. you see and so the state has been a state of intellectuals but somehow the system has spoiled within industry shifted it was the commercial uh, city of uh, india yes. it was the capital of india yes father yeah so they said what bengal thinks today the rest of india thinks tomorrow right father now it's no more so things have changed industries have shifted employment is very low and so we need to the first and foremost is we need to industrialize the state we need to invest start industries boost employment resources must be here we must encourage people to invest this is what it is so the one of the main areas but otherwise we are rich supply of electricity supply of water supply of resources everything is we are best but at the same time we are having unemployment now let's take this year we are known for our education best of universities that we have but our students are going out after 12 years of school they are looking for green pastures absolutely they are saying why should we study in west bengal there's a huge brain we will go to pune we will go to hyderabad yes, we will go to chennai yes, yes. we will go to mumbai we will go to uh, delhi we will go to various other cities bangalore even so outside are, the country outside the country okay so this is what is happening right now the trend is this that somehow many students are not realizing 
that here is something that they are missing and very good institutions that we have. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And some of them seem to be saying either St. Javier's or outside. <laughs> Now that St. Davis cannot admit everyone. Yes, but this is the trend and we will have to seriously think about it. We will have to keep our students. We will also have to encourage other students to come in here yes. and study in our state. Yes. Yeah, That is lacking. Yes. Not many students are coming in here to study. Yes. yes. Father, my penultimate question would be, what would be your, uh, if you have to say that one thing to all the aspiring educators, teachers, on how <laughs> they should play an active role in shaping the student's lives, Father? Because you have been. That's true. So how would, true. would you tell them? One, one is this, that every teacher, every educationist must take his work as a mission, not as a profession. Give importance to the salary that you get. Give importance to the remuneration that you get. It's part of life. We need to live. But that's not life. And so you will have to take it as a mission. Number two, that every student in the classroom that you teach, every student in the college or in the university, is a student under your care and concern. Your attention must be very personal. Care and concern is the most important thing. Third, you have to build up a good rapport with the student community and the parents of the students. Because your world should not be only the classroom within the four walls. Your world must be big. And at the same time, you make your God big. God must be big. Not just small God. You know, your world should not be small. You must think aloud. As they say, Think globally mm -hmm. and act locally. Right, father, yes. So if your thinking process is global and big, what you do in your school, in your college, mm -hmm. will always be very practical and successful. Right. This is what is the secret mantra. See, we need to transform this country. We need to transform our students. We need to transform our people. See, India is one of the most youthful countries in the world. 60% of our population is below 50. Future is bright. We are going to become economically, I don't want to say uh, army, no, militarily, mm. <laughs> but I want <laughs> to say <laughs> economically, yeah. educationally, right. in terms of development, we are going to become one of the superpowers of this world. Right. We will, definitely we will. But we must show the way. We must build. But there are certain inherent problems. Politics is one. Uh, religious violence is one. These are things that are inherent and holding us back. While China is going ahead, moving forward, uh, because of one line of thinking. But we have, uh, how many now? Almost 1.4 uh, billion. Yes, 1.4 billion right yeah. now. Yeah. So, <laughs> so 1,400 uh, million. Now, 1,400 million types of thinking. Yes. You see. <laughs> yeah. So this is where the problem is. Right. We are not thinking together. Right. We are not thinking alike. We are not putting our minds and hearts together. Uh, a lot of differences are dividing us. These divisive forces must go. Now, what is happening in Manipur? Same. Right. That's bad. That's not. On the basis of communities, on the basis of religion, on the basis of anything we should have. We are Indi Indians, basically Indians. Yeah, Indians. We must live as Indians. Right. Not as. So this whole concept of one country, we are one country, we are all Indians, we live together, personal life is totally different, right. your religious life is totally different, that must be taught in our schools and colleges. That's why we introduced in the university, also in the college in Park Street, what you call inter-religious studies for two credits. So we said every student who passes through the portals of this institution must respect, must have reverence for all religions. Not only for his religion or her religion, but for all religions. So if this inter-religious approach is there, things will be different. And that's what our teachers must teach. They cannot just separate themselves from students. I'm doing my duty. I teach what they... 
uh, teach whatever they want to learn, let them learn. No, no. A teacher must hold, embrace his students, uh, her students, and transform them and see that I have formed so many leaders. I have form, formed so many educationists, uh, so many social workers. This way, then you are proud of it, proud of your work. Otherwise, it's a failure. Right. So this would be my message to all the teachers and to students, of course. You know, today's students are today's leaders. Let's not speak of they are future leaders. They are leaders in their own sense. But if only they can concentrate, focus on their studies and come out with a tremendous resourceful, with a tremendous amount of talents, they can definitely contribute to the welfare of this country. Right. Yes. Father, to conclude uh, today's conversation, the three personal questions, Father, for all the people and the students and the alumni who love you and adore you. Uh, father, what is one thing that uh, uh, we would like to tell that Father Felix Raj does not own or something, something like one trivial thing, Father, which would be like a shock to you. Oh, Father Felix does not do this because for them you are he here. does not do. I am basically a Jesuit. Right. Basically a religious. Mm -hmm. What some people don't know is, some people think he, is, he was principal, he is now vice chancellor, mm -hmm. he must be having big bank accounts, mm -hmm. he may be having credit cards and all that. Mm -hmm. I don't have a credit card. What are you saying, Father? I don't have a credit card. I can't have a bank account. Mm -hmm. It is just because I retired. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's... Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we can't have... Nobody, not only me. No Jesuit father can have a bank account or can own a house. Or I, this, this shirt is not mine, which is not outside well. This shirt is not mine. Tomorrow, if my superior says, please give this shirt to somebody else, I have to give. I can't say no. Or today, I'm my chancellor. If tomorrow my provincial says, you are transferred from here to a village, I can't say no, I'm more qualified. How can I go to a village? I can't say. So life is that. So behind a Jesuit curtain is a life which many people don't know. This will be a revelation. I cannot father. say I have one rupee, two rupees, five rupees. No, not at all. Every pie, if somebody gives me ten rupees, it doesn't belong to me. It goes to a one who is in charge of it. I cannot keep it. So that is why we have taken what you call the vow of poverty, chastity and obedience. So I cannot say no to anything that I am told to do. I have to be not just marriage, that we are not married. It's not just marriage, it's much more than that. You see, that you can't have one small family, but today the whole world is my family. Every student who comes to this institution is my child. That's where the broad understanding, you know, people don't know that. People think, oh, he's a vice chancellor, he must be very rich. Uh -huh. This is uh, this is a secret of life. Right. Uh -huh. What to do? And we don't want to proclaim to the world we are of this type. But we are. We are about six Jesuits here, six fathers. All of us. We depend on the arms mm -hmm. or the little salary that the institution might give. Mm -hmm. So we don't demand. The Jesuits cannot demand anything. So they have to live a very simple life. Life of poverty. If today you don't have food, you don't have food, that's all. You can't demand, I want this and I want that. Yes, this is what life is. Right. Father, my last one, very simple. Which is your favorite city to live in, Father? Calcutta. <laughs> I enjoy living in Calcutta. Why? Uh -huh. If you go out for a day or two or a week or a month, mm. you must have that sense you are absent, you are missing something, yeah. like say homesick. Yeah, homesickness. Yes. Okay, you are out of your house, you feel homesick. You want to come back to your house. Yeah. The same way, if you are out of this town, you feel that that town sickness. <laughs> okay, You want to come back yeah. to that city where you live. Because this is a city where there is culture. This is a city where there is affection, where there is joy, where there is life. Okay, Because, as they say, you ask in Delhi, Sir, uh, where is that uh, building? Mm. Oh, go that side, go this side, go that side, this side, that's all. But here you ask somebody, he will say, Oh, you want to go to that place? Come, I will take you there mm. and leave you and go. Absolutely. See that well, personal touch. Yes, it is much more here. Yes, 
than anywhere else. Right. Yes, there are good cities definitely yeah. for various other things, but in terms of humanness, yeah. in terms of values, yeah. in terms of richness, Kolkata is the best. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for joining us on this Thank episode you so of much. Truths. I would Wonderful. request you to Father just write a small uh, note for the entire team of Christian Truths. Anything oh, lovely. with love, Father. Okay. Uh, what do I say? Father, you love and bless to you the you. entire team of well, Christian uh, Truths. Yeah. I put your name. Yes, Father. Short form DG? Yes, Father. What son do I put? You are this one. You are this one? Yes, David. Yes, Father. Father, if you can read that out once, Father. To the entire team of DG and Joydeep Sen, with blessings and warm regards for the wonderful service you all do. God bless you all. I believe in David. Thank you so much, Father. The mighty Thank man. You so much, Thank you so much, Father. Thank you so much, Thank Father, you, sir. for Thank being you. on this episode, Father. Thank you so much.